Bibles, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We are going to read through verses 8 to 13. There's one thing i got to bring to your attention in our bulletin. If you've been thinking about joining the church and you want to go to membership class, I know it says uh, March 12th. It's no longer on March 12th. It's the following week on the 19th. So if you are interested in joining us on that, it'll be after second service. Love to have you. And so just put that in your calendar. Sorry for the delay and having to make that kind of an adjustment, but due to the fact of our staff and our elders, a bunch aren't even going to be in, in town on that Sunday. We want you to get to know them, and we want to get to know you. So uh, put that down. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that scripture is supposed to breathe life into our hearts, transform us from the inside out, and make us more like you in your image. And so, God, I just pray that as we talk about church leadership and the way Paul presented that to Timothy and his desire for all the churches to navigate through towards this, God, I pray that you will help us to be a church that functions biblically, help us to be a church that leads appropriately and keep us from any of Satan's grip and his tricks and his tactics to try to destroy your church and help us to be uh, ever present as we are gathered today. Lord, I thank you for all the new people. I thank you, Lord, for those that are are checking us out. And I just pray that they will uh, see that we are a church of imperfect people, but our desire is to live life uh, with your purpose in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week we talked about elders, and I was going very long last week, and so there's a few things that I'm going to retouch about last week, this week, okay? And so it's kind of cross-relational here with deacons, as we're talking about deacons. Now, I have to tell you, the reason why this is important to dialogue and to go through church leadership is because... We want to make sure that we lead appropriately. And so whether you think you're a deacon or whether you don't think you're a deacon or whether you don't think you're an elder, it's still important to navigate through. Because I asked this question last week to both services, how many of you have ever left a church because of bad leadership? And I know at least 75% in first hour raised their hand, and I believe it was about 50-50 in here. We want to make sure that not all the pressure and the pain and the and the. Uh, uh, position is only held with deacons and elders. It actually is on us too as members of the gospel. And so it's important for us to get to know those that we vote for and those that we put into authority in a church. And so our church, Christ Community, is a church where you vote for your elders. You get to vote for them. So if you don't know them and you vote for them and then they do something stupid, Yes, the pressure's on them, but it's also on us for not knowing them, okay? So that's what we're going to navigate through today. Are you guys ready? I'm sure some of you were like, I can't wait to talk about deacons today. (laughs) You woke up and you're like, man, it's going to be a good one. Well, we'll see. (laughs) We'll see. Uh, Verse 8, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. I I believe it's on screen. We'll see. Uh, But if not, uh, you can follow along on your Bible app or, or your Bible. It says, deacons, likewise, must be dignified. Now, the word likewise means it, it kind of is attached to the previous verses that are talking about elders. They need to be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. So there's a testing period. Verse 11, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Now, he's addressing the wives of the deacons, but this is also needs to be addressed to the wives of elders. Okay, so we're going to talk about that towards the end. Verse 12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. All right, so this is what we get to talk about today. Now, I found this on the web. my goodness. <laughs> there we go. In leadership, in the world, let's just talk about the world for a second, outside the church realm, everything rises and falls on leaders, Right? However, we appoint the leaders, and then all the pressure and all the blame goes on them. It should also go on us for appointing those 
without really truly knowing. Now, I understand there's a humanness attached to this. But then we take that thinking and we bring it into the church. And good, right, or indifferent, maybe you think, well, if the elders put forth those names, I trust the elders of the church. So let's move forward with those names. And then we get those individuals and we put them in place of authority. And then we wonder why things happen. Now, granted, those individuals made those decisions, poor decisions, and then they ended up hurting the church. But we, as congregants, if we don't know who they truly are and we vote yes or put them forth by name, it's also on us. But it's easier for us to just do the blame game rather than taking on ownership on our own. And Paul is writing to Timothy and he's explaining this is kind of how the church needs to function. The church does need good, godly, character-building leaders. They need it as elders and they also need it as deacons. And as we talked last week, as an elder, it's an elder's job to guide and guard the flock spiritually, with vision, to make sure that we're following the gospel according to the letter of the gospel, to make sure that we're not going to the right or to the left with false teaching, to make sure that we are loving on and shepherding those that attend. That's the elder's role. And unfortunately, elders, especially in America, and I touched on this last week, is they spend more time focusing on deacon tasks than the elder role tasks. And so they are businessmen that tend to focus in on the money. Now, how many have ever heard the phrase, follow the money? Have you heard this before? Okay. Well, we throw this term out there and we go, follow the money, and now we know where corruption happens. Well, the same thing happens in the church. Follow the money and you get to understand the heartbeat of that church. You get to understand what's important to them. You get to understand what, what they feel uh, is their directive. Well, the money is handled by deacons. So the elders definitely put forth names of those that might be good with money. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But it's important that they focus in on it so that the elders can do the tasks that they are called to. But the word deacon it actually comes from the Greek word dekonos. And it usually is a general, broad term for servant. Now, you've probably heard the word servant before. How many have read the Bible and heard the word servant? Okay. It's a broad range of context throughout Scripture. For instance, in John chapter 2, verse 5 and 9, it says the servants at the wedding who carried the water, uh, the water containers, the mother in the passage tells the servants to do whatever they told them to do. So a servant basically means you are, we, as Christ followers, are servants, okay? If you believe in Jesus, we are the lowest of lows, meaning we put ourselves down here and we raise everybody else as more important than us. That's what Scripture says. The Apostle Paul calls himself a servant, minister of the new covenant in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. God has qualified us to be ministers of this new covenant. God has qualified us to be servants of the gospel in Colossians 1.23. God qualifies us to be ministers of his church, Colossians 1.24. So before I even talk about deacons, if you've been in the church a while, or if you call yourself a Christ follower, that means you're a servant for God's gospel. So if you've never spread the gospel, that's a problem. It's a problem. If you've never served as a minister of the gospel, that's a problem. That means in God's church, we aren't called to be pew warmers. And I know we don't have pews, so we're not called to be chair warmers. That means if we come just to attend, but don't participate in the gospel, we are not following the gospel. This does not mean that you need to go and give up your entire life to serve in, in a church building. However, if you haven't participated in anything, even being a smiling face at the door to greet people, are we serving? If you've never served your neighbor, are you serving? If you've never served the homeless and the poor, are you serving? We don't get to go, well, we're going to leave those roles to the elders and the deacons of the church, and we get to sit back and see what happens. No, 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 no. According to the gospel, 
if we get all the way down to that servant name, that servant title, we all, if Christ is our Lord, are called to serve. If you don't like that, don't get mad at me. Get mad at God, because he's the one that wrote it, right? And there's not just one verse where he talks about servants. It's all interlaid all throughout Scripture, okay? So if it were only one verse, then maybe we had something to talk about. But this is all throughout Scripture. Therefore, we don't get a free pass to just not do anything. But is this what, what Paul is trying to address to Timothy? Let's keep going. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, when then, when then is Apollos, what is Paul, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each? Ephesians 6, 21 talks about servants. Timothy is called God's servant, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. When he sent Timothy, our brother, and God's servant to the gospel of Christ. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, the disciples are told that if they want to be great, they must be servants. Whoever would be great among you must be a servant. And there are several definitions of this broad sense of this word servant. So we all are servants. Whether you like it or not. It means we've got to get to work. And there are several definitions of this broad sense of this Greek word. So what does Paul mean now when he's talking about the qualifications of deacons? So at the grassroots, the level, we are all called to be servants, meaning everybody is more important than us. Then there's another layer, which is what he calls deacons. Then there's a layer above that, which he calls elders. And we talked a lot about that last week, so I'm not going to really go back down that train until we get to the wives. But deacons. What is the role of a deacon? The basic meaning of this dicon word group is practical, active, helping with respect to the basic necessities of life. It's taking the resources in the church and having a group of men and women disperse that money within the areas that are of need. Matthew 25, verse 44, we can conclude that the needs that arise through hunger now, if I see people that are hungry, I'm going to give money towards that. But using church funds, we want to make sure that we have those that are overseeing that to give the money out correctly. This means when they're thirsty, they're hungry, they're alienated, they're naked, they need clothing, sickness, imprisonment, we are called to go and serve those individuals in those communities. But it takes a group of men and women that are raised up in the church to go and see what ministries need to be affected. So this would imply the basic notion of serving in the sense of being a deacon is to help meet the needs of others for food, water, water clothing, health, whatever needs arise through emergencies. For instance, we've had a few deaths here in the last number of weeks, and there are those that can't afford even the ceremony. And so what do we do as a church? Well, we've had men gather around and go, how do we pull benevolence funds to go and help? That's important, church. That's important. That's what we're called to do. But would we just trust our money with just anybody? The term is applied to ministries of the word and apostleship in Christ's own ministry to show that they are to be done humbly and in compassion with the benefits of others. So it's not about making our pockets fatter. It's about giving out the resources that God has given us. And unfortunately, we have humans running these things. And all of us are faulty. All of us make bad choices. However, we are called to be good stewards of God's resources. So when Jesus says in Luke chapter 22, verse 26, that the leader should become one who serves as Christ served us, he does not mean that there are no differences between leader and non-leader. So like I said, we have the grassroots level that if you're a Christ follower in here, you are called to serve. So I can't tell you if you're serving or not. This is between you and the Lord. You might want to write that question down. God, am I serving the way that you've called me to serve? Are you serving your spouse the way that God has called you to serve? Are you serving your kids the way God has called you to serve? Are you serving your neighbor the way God has called you to serve? Are you serving those that are, are in your job the way God has called you to serve? I can't answer that. That's between you and the Lord. 
But that's a question worth asking. Now we go to another layer. And this is what Paul is talking about. The offices of deacon and elder are high offices. And it's very, very important, church, that you participate correctly in testing and approving those that you place in authority in the church. And I gave you a list of bad stories of what took place in several other churches that I've been in. But I'll tell you right now, if all you do is go, yeah, James likes that guy. Let's have him be an elder. That's probably not a good way of voting. Or if you walk into the church and that person was standing at the door and they shook your hand and, and you're like, yeah, seems like a nice person. Has a smile on their face. So let's vote for them to be an elder or a deacon. Probably not good enough, right? Because everyone's on their best behavior at church. Let's keep going. So it appears then that deacons in 1 Timothy 3 that we just read and also in the book of Philippians chapter 1, which you can read later if you want, there's qualifications. So you ready to go through the qualifications? It's going to sound very similar to elders. Let's go. Number one, man. Now, I said this last week, we as elders are praying through what, what the roles of the ministry look like for women in ministry, okay? So I'm not going to touch on that too much. I'm not going to... Uh, show the cards too early, but it's important to know what, uh, what Paul was addressing here. Men certainly qualify to hold this office of deacon according to not only this passage of 1 Timothy, but also in Acts chapter 6, verse 3. However, some propose that women may also do so and have this title as a deaconess, and there, there's some backing for that. Okay, for instance, Paul names a lady named Phoebe as a servant of the church in Romans chapter 16, verse 1. So whether you agree with women being a deacon or not, you can't skip past Romans 16, 1. Now, I'm not going to say that that's the trump card, but I'm also not going to say that God didn't have other individuals who are female be deacons with just brushing over it, okay? Okay. But I will say, let's put a pin in it. Can we put a pin in it? Let's put a pin there, and we'll move on. And I tell you, by the end of the year, the elders will have something to share with you when it comes to that role of deacon and deaconesses, okay? But you can't just breeze through it. The word in our English translations, however, render as the wives of deacons, may easily be translated as women in general, okay? So on this basis, some churches appoint both men and women as deaconesses. I've been in those churches before. It's people that basically take resources of the church and function, whether it be building and grounds or communion or children's ministry, youth ministry, and the like. But this is one of those passages we're going to stick a pin in, okay? All right, let's move on to the next thing. He goes on and he says what? Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued. So what does dignified mean? It means reverent. What does this term mean? This qualification suggests that a prospective deacon must be a serious-minded person who approaches life and ministry in a dignified and purposeful way. It basically means that he should be neither frivolous nor aloof. Now, I don't want you to get this twisted, okay? It's not saying that being a deacon or an elder, that means you have to be extroverted, not introverted. It's not talking about that. You can be an introvert and still be an elder and a deacon, and you can be an extrovert and still be an elder and a deacon. But aloof means that you're not approachable. So if you have elders or deacons or deaconesses in the church and they're not approachable, they should not be in that role. If you know nothing about them and you try to go up and say hi, and they're like, they walk the other way, you might want to rethink who you're voting on. Okay? They have to be approachable, earnest and winsome in their interaction with others. Their lifestyle should be worthy of respect and emulation. Worship should be wholehearted and sincere. Now, when I say the word worship, I'm not talking about three, four, or five songs that we do on a Sunday morning and where we sing. That's not what I mean by worship. I'm talking about worship as a lifestyle. That you see the worship of their relationship with the Lord throughout their life. It's emulated, right? You see it. It's tangible. They're not reserved and aloof. 
They are presenting it, not in a fake and phony way, not when they bring the biggest King James Bible in and they, they do one of these. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they're humble, but yet you see through their life. Jesus says they will know us by our what? Fruit. So you see the fruit in their life, in that role. That's what reverent means. Then he goes on and gives the next one. He said they, they need not be double-tongued. Now that's different. He didn't say that in, as far as the elders go, but that's still an important uh, qualification, I would say, for both elders and deacons. What does it mean to be double-tongued? Dishonest. dishonest. What else? Who wants to play? No consistency. I like that. What else? Yes. Perfect. So you hear something from this person and then you say it and then you go over here and go, well, really, I don't really agree with that. It's over here. Double tongue means you're not consistent, could be hypocritical, two-faced. And I think there's a lot of two-faced deacons and two-faced elders. That's a problem. It's a problem. And think about the churches that Paul is writing to. These are small churches. It's not like three to four hundred people. We're talking 20, 25, maybe 30, 10, 7. These are the churches, right? The gospel is spreading and people are coming out of the woodwork to gather in home churches. And Paul is listing this out. Why is he listing this out? Because he already saw problems. He already saw problems. And if there's already problems in 1 Timothy, what makes us think there's not going to be problems 2,000 years later? We got bigger problems because there's more people. Right? We got issues. And so Paul is addressing this going, I've seen a lot of double-tongued people and it's unacceptable. Say what you want about the Apostle Paul. Paul would say something to one church and he would say the exact same thing to the next church and he would say the exact same thing to the next church. He was not double-tongued. What you saw is what you got from Paul. It ticked people off, but he was consistent, very consistent. What else? A single-tongued deacon strengthens the unity of the church. What they say is what it is. You hear from different people in different parts of the church go, yeah, that person's very consistent. That builds the church up. Double-minded actually tears it down. He goes on. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine. Now, I talked about wine and alcohol a lot last week, so I don't think I need to rehash it. But it does not mean that if a deacon or an elder has a drink of wine or a beer that they're disqualified, okay? It just says that they're not into too much of it, okay? Meaning they could have a beer and still be sound. But if it becomes a vice and they're not making sense and it's not being clear, that might be a disqualifying factor. So I'm not going to keep talking about that. Are you cool with that? Can I just leave that? Yes. Awesome. Then we go on, number five. He says, they're not greedy for dishonest gain. Why do you think Paul reiterates, similar to what he said to deacon or to elders about deacons not being greedy of money? Why do you think that's important? Because money can quickly become a false god. Money could easily become a false god. I even told you, follow the money. Yes. Root of all kinds of evil. Yep. Yep. So we vote, right? Let's just step out of the church for a moment. We vote and we expect those that we put into authority or in leadership, whether Washington State or in the United States, and we hope that they're going to be okay. But then when they make a bad business deal or when there's some issues going on with money, we go, I can't believe it, man. The, the root of all evil is money and follow the money and all this stuff. Who, who appointed them? You did. So now let's bring it back into the church. We have issues in the church. People are laundering money. They're using money for dishonest gain. You got deacons and elders and staff buying 
buying vehicles and houses and apartments in other states off of church dimes. And, and we go, I can't believe that it got out of control. Well, it's because maybe we're too trusting or maybe we didn't ask enough questions. Deacons handle the financial affairs of the church firsthand by receiving, allocating, and distributing the funds and at times can be tempted to use that office for their own personal advantage. Where does this come into play in the church where that, that uh, deacon might have a passion for one thing, so they take money out of this and they move it over here without getting a vote? Oops. Might be a good ministry, but they're doing it secretively. That's an issue. So this requires the absence of any personal conflict of interest regarding financial gain. So what's a personal uh, conflict of interest that you've seen in churches? Uh, deacons that hold, oversee money but have staff that they're related to? Whether, whether they meant that to happen, it can be conflict of interest. What else could be a conflict of interest when it comes to money in the church? I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Excessive debt. Now, I'm not saying that any time that we have somebody present them as a deacon that you have to go, hey, I need to see your, your uh, budgets at home. I'm not saying they got to come up here and have a nice PowerPoint spreadsheet and, and show you every, everything in their personal finances, but you definitely want to make sure that they're, they're, there's a track record of not excessive debt. Uh, wasteful spending, extravagant living, workaholism, financial depend de dependency, questionable business practices. What is that? <clears throat> if you have your own business and you slap a Jesus fish on the back, it doesn't necessarily mean you're handling it correctly. Just because you got a cool Jesus fish doesn't mean you're not stealing from people or you're not hiking up prices or you're not, you see what I'm saying? And yet, when we see people in the business realm, we go, oh, they're really good with money, and then we bring them here, and then we find out later that people in the community can't stand them because they're, they're, they're stealing or they're being deceitful. It's no wonder why there's issues in the church. So prospective deacons should be faithful, content, impartial stewards in the financial realm. That means we have to leave our opinions out of it. This is really tough. I remember one church we were at, we had a gal in our church that ran our finances. And I had to have a conversation with her. I said, look, whenever you see budgets come through or different ministries using money and stuff like that, you're going to have to keep your biases out of it because you could become offended very fast. And sure enough, it happened. Right? It happens. Because they'll see the youth guy. The youth guy, I keep picking on youth guys, but for some reason we get bad raps. Youth guys go, well, I'm going to take so-and-so out for, for lunch and just hang out with them and meet with them. Well, then you might take that same individual out, and so maybe you have 12 times throughout a year it's that same individual or a couple youth kids. And so then the lady that runs the money goes, uh, this is a consistent thing, and uh, now we're just spending too much money when the music department really needs this. could be a problem, right? So you got to keep your biases out of it. All right, let's move on. Number six. He goes on, verse 9. They must hold the ministry of the faith with a clear conscience. What does it mean to have a, a pure, clear conscience? Can anyone have a pure, clean conscience? Can we be closer to it? How do we get closer to a, a pure, clean conscience? Honesty, holy living? Short accounts? Staying in the Word. What else? Consistently repenting. Um, I don't know. It's uh, God the Father, God the Son, and oh, oh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called to what? Bring conviction. So when we walk daily by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're constantly being refined. I call it gardening. Gardening the heart. Pruning the trees. Unfortunately, a lot of us, we only like to prune and garden once a week. So Sunday tends to be our gardening pruning time. And then all the rest of the week we get to do whatever we want, right? No. According to Scripture, this is a daily walk. And so a deacon who is committed to a pure conscience is daily going to be questioning decisions. 
Not decisions of others, because that's very easy to point fingers, but decisions of themselves. God, am I handling these resources correctly? God, I have a desire to go this way with it, but is that just me or is that you? Does that make sense? And so that's what he's trying to say here. They allow the gospel to train every aspect of their conscience so that the choices they make in their daily life correspond to the kind of genuine godly, godliness revealed in Christ. What did Jesus do? He walked the earth teaching what? Holy living. But he would get away and go and pray to seek what? His marching orders. So if you don't see that going on in an elder or a deacon, that's a problem. That becomes more their strength and ego rather than God's direction. A clear conscience, they do not separate their lives into separate compartments. What it means by that is you don't, you don't put on a deacon hat or an elder hat here at church and then you go home and you throw it. You go, I'm no longer a deacon, I'm an elder. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, right? That's a double-minded person. So you're on your best behavior at church, but when you get home, there's other issues going on? No, you're, you're an elder or you're a deacon? Like you have that. It's your job. It's your role. It's God's office for you. So you got to be the same way at church as you are at home. And if you're not, that's a problem. All right, then we go on to number seven. Don't worry, two more and you're out of here. <laughs> Proven track record. He said this about uh, elders last week, but he's saying it again with deacons. A church should not appoint a new convert to the office of deacon or elder, nor should they appoint others with whom they are not familiar with. If you don't know your elder, if you do not know your deacon, do not vote for them. I, I love throwing grenades. I guess I've been doing it a lot more lately. I'm pulling a pin and I'm tossing it out there. I'll tell you right now. Our business meeting, our church business meeting, when it comes to uh, voting on church finances and or elders, the numbers of people that attend are very small. I think 20 to 50 people max, maybe, in a church of 400? It's not a good number. Now, it might very well be because you're like, well, I trust them to make the right decision. Well, have you ever left a church because of bad leadership? If you have, you could be part of the problem. Yes, that elder or that deacon is an issue, potentially, but so is voting without knowing. So what do we do? I, I posed this last service. What would it take for you as, as somebody who attends Christ's community that loves the gospel of Jesus, what kind of testing would you love to see in a deacon and an elder? And uh, maybe we have an elder here that could take notes. Oh my goodness. Wisdom. Okay, unpack that. What is wisdom? Okay. Knows the truth and speaks it. You want to see decisions they've made in the past. Decisions they've made in the past. Okay. What else? How are they serving? How they handle conflict. How they handle conflict. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How they handle conflict. How often do they pray? What else? Can they love people when it's hard? I mean, would you vote for someone like that? Do you think that's happening? Do you know? Do you come to the meeting? I'm just, I'm just delivering mail. Don't shoot me, okay? I'm reading the mail. I'm delivering the mail. But I've just seen too many churches go through this where it's like, I trust you. But then when something goes down wrong, it's like, I can't, I can't believe I'm leaving this church. And yet, you're part of it. So we as leaders are a part of the problem, but so are the attenders. We all have a part to play in God's church, right? Part of serving is making sure that the servants you put in authority 
are serving correctly. Get to know them. Get to know them. Do you know your elders? Do you know your deacons? If you don't, don't vote. But if you're going to vote, get to know them. Ask them out for coffee. Ask them out for a burger. If you're vegan, don't go to a burger place. Go somewhere else. But get to know them. Why? Because the ownership's on us. We are called to lead God's church appropriately. And for a deacon and an elder, they need to have a proven track record. He says they must be tested. Tested. Before a church appoints a deacon, they must test them first, verifying their character. Just because they stand up here and say, I'm a good guy. Do you really believe that? The only way you're going to know if I'm a good guy is if you see me outside of church. Like I said, we're all on our best behavior on, on a Sunday. Right? We've got our church face on. I call it the mask. We wear our mask. Nobody knew that we yelled at our kids on the way to church. Nobody knew that we uh, smacked our spouse. Nobody knows because at church we're okay. The only way you know is if you test them first. To rush into a position can actually cause unfortunate results, and we see this in the news. How many church leaders have fallen? It didn't just happen. It didn't just happen. It's a track record of bad decisions, and then boom, it happens. You know, you, you hear this on the news, you go, I can't believe that person blew up a school. Makes no sense. But did you know them? Did you see any bad track records? Did you see any of the history? No, we like to walk around with blinders on until something happens. Then we go, I'm really disappointed. Right? I guess that was a pretty bad analogy to pull that one out. I mean, there's some, some other stories I could have used there. I'm sorry. We don't want to hurt the church. We don't. And here at Christ Community, we don't want to hurt the church either. So I say push forward and get to know the people that, that um, their names are being put forward to elders and deacons. All right, last point. Last one here. He, he goes on. And now he talks about good family relationships. And, and I love this, but it's uncomfortable, okay? Especially for those that are deacons and elders in the church. This is uncomfortable. Because if you're married to a deacon and an elder, you are now under the same microscope. This qualification encompasses the domestic reputation of a prospective deacon as a husband and a father. How do you know if I'm a good husband? How do you know if I'm a good father? Ask my wife. And if you know anything about my wife, she's a truth teller. She will tell you if it's true or not. Ask my kids. Ask my kids. Get to know them. Don't get to know them for information. Get to know them for who they are. Okay, so, so for instance, when, when I'm up here and you're asking me questions, I'm giving you answers, but talking to my wife and talking to my kids is a very important thing to do. But as a pastor, as an elder, it's very hard too. Because... How authentic can the relationship be with my wife? If you go take her out for coffee, how is she going to know you're not there just to gain intel? Because unfortunately, that's kind of how it works. Can you go and say, hey, I just want to take you out for a cup of coffee and not ask anything about church? Amazing. How amazing would that be? Talking to my kids and not going, what's it like having a dad who's a pastor? Like, they already know, right? But what would it be like to go hang out with my boys and go, how are you doing? How are you doing? That's when you know the church is functioning correctly. Is it my job to love my wife and love my boys? Absolutely. But being part of the church, it's important. Now, why would Paul address the wives of the deacons and the elders? Why would he address it? Because he probably already knew there were issues. Right? He goes on, he says, And let them be tested first, 
Then let them serve as deacons as they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. What was going on in churches is you got wives uh, uh, doing some pretty foolish things. Or you got wives that aren't participating. Or you got wives that are aloof. Or you got wives that are slandering. Or you got wives that are gossiping about stuff. This does not require a deacon or an elder to be married or to even have children, but the experience certainly gives a man the advantage, increased perspective, experience, and maturity. For instance, if you've been married more than a year, you probably know it's going to take some maturity to stay in that relationship, right? So being married could be a great thing for a deacon and an elder. How about having kids? Do they test you? Do they, does it... Give you perspective of life. It's kind of interesting when you're, you're leading a church and you've never had kids or have never been married, you're kind of behind the curve a little bit. Doesn't mean you can't, but you're behind the curve a little bit. Having kids and going, oh, you know what it's like. It helps grow you to maturity. The nature of this role, though, requires his spouse also to exhibit certain qualities of a godly woman and helpmate. Like her husband, she must be reverent and serious-minded about life and ministry. So I'll tell you right now, the elders in our church, do you know their wives? Do you know their wives? If you don't, get to know them. And elder wives that are in the church, do you know your people? If you don't, get to know them. Because that, that should be a question mark. Right? How did I ask you about testing your elders and your deacons? Oh, how are they? Where are they serving? What are they doing? Now, it doesn't mean that the, the, the spouse of that deacon or elder need to be the head of a women's ministry or the head of communion or things like that. But if they're not approachable, that's a problem. And if we are currently uh, wives or spouses of elders and deacons and we're not approachable, we need to change as well. Because I've had plenty of uh, youth pastors that are wanting to be youth pastors that have trained and developed that might qualify to that role but are disqualified based off their spouse because the spouse wants nothing to do with it. It's virtually impossible to have a healthy ministry if a wife is not interested. So that's important. That's why he threw this out there. She should be free from the tendency towards gossip. Guess what? Women, I hate to tell you, I've said this before, you're gossipers. It's all through Scripture. I didn't say it. It's there. Guys, they talk, but they go face to face and they deal with the issue that's just a guy thing. Women can be catty, according to scripture, and they go and talk to other women about other women. So, as a leader and a spouse of a leader, we got to make sure we don't do that too. Now, I would hope as a Christian, we don't do that, right? So, Lord, change us. But insulting language, false accusations, hurtful speech, that'll destroy a ministry. And it'll destroy a church. With every man that has fallen in the church, there is a, a, usually a wife right there too. But we don't hear about them. We hear about the guy. Because he had more of the role. But it doesn't mean the spouse didn't participate in any of that. Fair enough? Oh, man. So I'll echo this. This is also a qualification of elders' wives. They also need to be demonstrate clear thinking, emotional stability, self-control, freedom from the addiction of alcohol. Altogether, she should be reliable and trustworthy in every way. Their children, also the same thing. I, and I, this goes without saying, it's usually the elders' kids that cause the most problems in churches. Have you heard this before, or is this new? They're usually the ones that go and talk all the time. They don't pay attention. They're kind of just being like little heathens running around the church. Now, it's not everybody, but it is pretty common. So, now, they might be youth. They might make bad decisions. But if there's a consistent pattern, we got problems. So, in conclusion, let me finish with this and I'll close in prayer. It would seem then that the deacon office exists to assist leadership of the church by relieving the elders of the distractions and the pressures that would divert them from the ministry of the word, the ministry of prayer, 
and the ministry of vision and oversight of the church. And so deacons are really important in the church to take the financials, the building, all that stuff off the leaders. And I've been here for three years, and this is something I've been trying to get off the elders' table, and it's really hard because it's really easy to talk about the resources and the money in the building. But that is not what our job is to do. So we need men and women that can rise up and take that leadership so that we can focus in on the guiding and the guarding of the flock. That's the point of elders and deacons in the church, whether it be a small church, a home church, or a larger church. Let's pray. Glorious Father, thank you for today. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you push our buttons. You're, you're, you're pushing your church to function correctly. Lord, may we dive into these texts and really get to know the people that are leading. May we get to know the spouses and the children. May we get to know if we are the same way we are at church as we are in the community. May we resemble your likeness and not ours. God, if we've been doing things backwards or if we're, we're mishandling things, God, convict us. Help us to repent from that and get right with you. Because, Lord, we do not want to destroy your church. We want to edify it and build it up. And the only way that's possible is if we humble ourselves as the biggest servants of all, we begin to love our wives, love our children, love our church, love our neighbors, love our coworkers the way that you've designed us to do so. But God, as I've talked about the leaders in the church, I also want to talk to those that are Christ followers in here. God, I pray that if we are not serving the way you've asked us to serve, I pray that we will make the, the, the new choices that we need to make. Help us to spread your gospel. Help us to love others. Help us to engage our community. In Christ's name, amen.